Wait, wait, wait. I'm not ready. Do you want to close the door? It's fine. Somebody will be mad. Okay. Ready? Three, two, one. Action. <laughs> Hi, everybody. I'm a Disney Bonnie, DDR4. This is just for the benefit of whoever sees it on YouTube and stuff. So, um, I just prepared this stuff for our junior residents since I'm outgoing. And you guys, I realize, have, don't have any source of advice. You know, I, I realize that when I was in my third year, second year, nobody told me about this stuff. I had to do my own research, took a lot of time and effort, and I didn't want everybody to duplicate it unnecessarily. So, um, try to condense things as much as possible, but you guys will still have to do your own research, um, because I'm hoping that you won't have to do as much as I did. Um, and hope you, hopefully I'll be pointing you in the right direction. So, um, uh, this will be a sort of a hodgepodge of topics, mainly about the Jalen Waver. A lot, a, lot, a lot of stuff about you know contracts and compensation and stuff. Um, a little bit about you know residency issues that we need to plan to have a successful post residency experience um, or post fellowship experience. Sort of would be relevant from for anybody graduating from residency, regardless of the program, uh, as as long as they are in the primary care field. And um, yeah, that's about it. Um, it's also useful for fellows who are on the J-1 visa, so that, and I, I, I will send it out to the child fellows later, the YouTube link. Um, so the first thing, you know, what do we need to plan for? We're doing our studying, we're great doctors, we spend so much time and effort into all of this stuff, and do we plan enough for, you know, finances, do we plan enough for the future, the job market? Where is that training? And especially for those who are on visas and immigrants, they have a long, complicated process ahead of them which they need to know about. Um, if not done in time, we can face significant problems. Sometimes we might even could end up you know, having to go to a country or having travel issues. It's just, it can be a mess. Um, to start with, uh, I'll start with uh, what do you need to plan for? Most of you, again, I think most of you are seniors here, Carmen. Have you given your step three yet? Yep. Uh, so by the end of the second year, you have to finish your step three. This is more for the benefit of the first and second years. Um, that's the first thing you do. And most of you have done it already. Um, the next thing would be, you know, unless you finish step three, you can't really apply for jobs and stuff, but you need your li state licenses and stuff. So, and for, for your state license, you need pretty, pretty much need your step three all the time. Uh, so that's some basic requirement. Um, what do you want to do after residency? So I'll, I'll keep this simple and short mostly. I'll try not to go into too many details unless they are really relevant. Um, and the resources I, resources I hand out to you later on email and stuff will sort of cover up the whatever extra information you need. Uh, so by the time you finish second year, you need to know what you want to do with your life after residency. Do you want to go to a fellowship? Do you want to go to a job? Do you want to go to a job temporarily and then go to a fellowship? All this stuff you need to have decided on, because if, if it's not done in time, uh, and the planning is not done in time, then you risk, you know, sort of not having your plans come to fruition as you envisage. So, a um, couple years before graduation, just decide what you want to do. Why? Okay, for example, somebody's going to child side. So, by the time they come into third year, um, fourth year is sort of, they go directly into child. It's an accelerated program. By, by the third year, they have to, you know, sort of finish their competencies, the psychotherapy stuff, and all of that, the research stuff, um, and uh, they also need to apply for child side by the September of their third year. Now, to have applied, you have to have your letter of recommendation ready. You have to have your competencies done. It's it can be a mess if you haven't organized yourself beforehand. Um, so that's why it's important to you know get things done at least a couple years before. Again, for the J-1 visa holders, and the H-1 people too, to a certain extent, uh, if you don't decide by the third year, you can't start looking for jobs. You have to start looking for jobs for J-1 visa holders about 18 months ahead of, of schedule. And I'll tell you why. I'll give you the details in a little bit. Um, 
once you decide what you want, you also need time to make sure you have the, the necessary edge above the other people. You, know? you have to have some research. You know? Say you want to go to pain medicine. You know? you want, the other residents want to go to pain medicine. And there have been just psych residents in the past from a site that have gone to pain medicine and other competitive sleep medicine specialties. So that's not something out of your reach. So that's why I also want to tell you, please believe in yourself. That faith in yourself is very important. Couldn't emphasize it more. So, or if you want to go to pain medicine or competitive specialty, you, know, you want to at least have some kind of research, some kind of publication, you know, at least related to pain medicine, or you know, at least somewhat close in nature to it. Um, you have to figure out your elective time. You know, the Do you have electives in your fourth year, Dr. Yeah, Dr. Lee? So, um, figure out what your electives are. They should be related to your pain medicine. You know, I think Dr. Pilla went to. Um, Hopkins for his pain medicine elective. Wow. So you can figure that out, go there, get the experience, get the required networking done. So so that you know later on it would come in handy for a sort of recommendation for you know, even applying to Hopkins or something like that. So or so applying to the place you want to go to. Um, some people who are just interested, interested in private practice can sort of interface with private practitioners. Um, you can get you know sort of work through your program to get outside electives. Dr. Killian offers the forensic thing interest in forensic psychiatry, you can go work with him an extra month or something. So that's important. So if you decide early on enough, you can figure out what your electives are going to be instead of just choosing something. Um, you will need to get your permanent license um, once you are in third year. Why? Because um, without your permanent license, your visa applications, for, especially for the German people, it can be delayed. Can, it can interfere. You, know, you need your license to be able to go ahead and say, yes, I have a license, I want to apply for a job and stuff. I think it's part of the application process. Uh, I know I had to submit mine. Um, the DEA number is necessary. This, yes? Permanent license, like, uh, you told, uh, in third year you have to apply? So what Once you done it separately, you can apply for a permanent license. Oh, so the, what are the criteria? Like, you have to be have two years of residency or nothing like that? If you are done with internship, you're done with I don't, I don't remember exactly, but Vivian Smith can give you the exact requirements and stuff. As, as far as I know, once you're done with step three, you can go ahead and get your permanent license. Okay, and that too, if you're planning job in Illinois State, or it doesn't matter. Regardless. Regardless. Regardless of where you want to practice, especially if you're in German. If you're just, you know, American, American citizen or green card, green card holder, that doesn't come into that much of a picture. You can get your license, but it still takes about two to three, four months, depending on how backed up they are and stuff uh, in the, the licensing office. I think the Illinois Department of Professional and Financial Regulation, each state has its own, but um, mine took like three or four months to process. And I had to go personally and push them to for them to be able to do that for me. Sometimes, so, so also the fact is that please don't trust bureaucracies. I'll give you another example that's gonna sort of be more hard hitting, but we'll uh, come to that later. And how much it cost? Uh, license, I think, the permanent license until until I applied for it was like maybe 200 or something. And I think there was some debate there with the ISMS the, and they proposed g going up on the physician licensing thing. I think now it's like 800 or something. I'm not sure about it. 300? Okay. okay. Awesome. So, Thank you. There was a proposal to go up very high, I think. So anyways, so I am not sure of that. So sure. please check back with me again. Um, the DEA number is something you need, but this is more on later. But obviously, before you graduate, you would want to get your permanent license, the controlled substances license, which is pretty much the parallel, sort of parallel process and a permanent license anyway. And then you also need to get your DEA number before you graduate, ideally, because um, that will be also needed for you to practice anyway and fix the scheduled substances. Um, as I said, I told you about it, my controlled substances registration. This goes hand in hand with the permanent license. It's the same application, you just fill out an extra piece of paper. Um, and it costs you like five dollars or something extra. Or, anyway, um, and then you'll have to apply for your psych boards too. Um, my case was a little different because I was a little off cycle, but usually, uh, usually the psych boards applications are available around November of every year. Um, at least it's true for this year. 
So the, the meetings are in November. You have to have a dead, you have to apply before the deadline of February first. So say you're in fellowship or residency um, by the fourth year February, you're, you have to finish, have applied both of side boards, and it costs you. So you have to plan for that money too. And that's why I'm saying figure out everything by the, by the third year so that you can plan to save that money. We're residents, we don't make millions of dollars or the big bucks yet. So, um, you know, you want to plan for that money. Otherwise, you have big loans and stuff. It can get problematic, especially with those who have families and all. So, the exam is usually in September. Um, but applying stuff has to be done pretty much very, very early. I think I asked Vivian if they had another cycle of exams. She said there wasn't. So, it's just in September. Um, what do the J1 residents and fellows need to prepare for? A lot. A lot. It's a huge headache. So, let me try and divide it for you. Start looking for jobs 18 months before you graduate. Why? Most states start J1 processing, especially for the Conrad 30 program. I'll tell you what it is. Um, they start processing for it like September, October of every fiscal year. They follow the fiscal year, which basically starts from, uh, lasts from September, oh, sorry, October to October. Um, uh, now, so if you want to be able to submit your application for a J1 waiver by October of your, say, fourth year or, or final year of training, regardless of residency or fellowship, then you have to have a contract in hand. To have a contract in hand, you have to have interviewed at several jobs, looked at some. So looking for a job and all and getting to the point of, yes, I want this job and I am okay with all of this stuff on this in this particular place and I'm ready to sign the contract, all of this process can will take you about five, six months, sometimes more for most people. And that's why 18 months is a reasonable figure. Some people might need a little more. Start looking for jobs 18 to 20 months before you graduate, regardless of whether it's fellowship or residency. Um, I'll get, give you more details in a little bit. But big, make sure you remember this figure, because that's going to be very important. 18 to 20 months, start looking, if you're going for a job. Uh, even if you're going for a fellowship, have a job as a backup plan if the fellowship doesn't go through, because that's just good planning. Because if your fellowship falls through and you don't have a job lined up, you'll be scrambling for a last moment job, which might pay less, and which may not materialize. You might have to go back to your home country and apply from there, which is going to be even more difficult. It just, you know, just disrupts everything. I'm sure you wouldn't want it. So, and then uh, beforehand, you know, for all the interviews and stuff, people would ask for references and letters, and rec letters of recommendation and stuff. Even if you're applying for a fellowship, you need the recommendation letters. You need to figure out what you want to do, and that, based on that, you know, request who you want to, which of the attendees you want letter of recommendations from, and you know, at least you need at least three or four people. So make sure your attendees are on your side. Be nice to them, <laughs> and uh, yeah, so that you know they can give you good letters of recommendation. So I feel the SOTUS is usually pretty nice about that, but you know, it, it always works to do your, do your own due diligence. So get those ready about half years ahead of time so that you know when you apply for jobs this is especially for the J1 people um, so that the, if the letter of recommendation is ready they, you can you know pass those on to the, the uh, job people the employers and stuff the potential employers um, they'll mostly ask you for references mainly but you have to still clear that stuff with your attendees and they should be willing to do that um, Finish your job search uh, in interviews and you sign your contract by the August or the final year of training because you want to have to be able to figure things out and stuff. September, October, you have to submit the signed contract to the whichever interested government agency you're submitting to the J1. I'll get to that later. That, that process is a little complicated, but usually September, October, this is your time for to have your signed contract ready, your application for J1 waiver, everything ready from the Department of State. You submit it, you know, from October 1st, usually most states, it's, it's like that. Um, if you let this go by, you know, usually lots of high demand states with bigger cities like Chicago, Pennsylvania, or you know, New York and stuff, they run out of their J1 waiver jobs for the Conrad 30 thing, usually in the first month. Well, a lot of states. So you don't want to end up in some place where you really don't want to be. And that's why do it on time. 
September and October of which year? Okay. Yeah. So, as I said, 18 months before graduation, you have to plan things out if you're looking for a job. And so 18 months before graduation, for example, will be different for different people. So if, if it's just a, just a, a side resident. So yeah, in second year. So sort of end of second year and stuff, you have to start yeah. your, you know, that would be two years before graduation. No, yeah, so middle years. of your third year, you have yeah. to be sort of ready to start looking for jobs. Make sense? And uh, the So that is that October. Sorry? That, that, that October. No, yeah, that, this, is, this is the fourth year of October. This is the October when you are, of your, you are applying. Yeah, this is the fourth year of your final year of training, residency or fellowship. Okay. For you, it will be your fifth year. Okay. For you, it will be your fourth year of fourth October. Year October. Okay. I mean, when, when you were starting, yes, last year. Mm -hmm. So you're starting your last year in June or July. By time, by October, you should have your, you know, by August of that fourth year, like. Two months into your fourth year, you, you need to have your sorry. Final year, you have you need to have your contract, uh, contract ready with the employers and stuff. And then by October, you have to apply. October first, submit the application. Mm -hmm. You'll have to wait. Illinois, for example, the last ten years, it's always fill this position in the first month. By end of October, they are done. No more Conrad thirty spots. How many spots will be there? Thirty, thirty, thirty spots each year. And feel free to ask me questions. There's no problem. This is important. And it's regardless of specialty, thirty spots. Sorry. 30 spots for psychiatry or? Every specialty combined. So all specialty combined, just 30 spots. They have specific slots allotted for psychiatry. I think six or seven of, of them are only for psychiatry. So that's an advantage we have, but it's not much of an advantage. <laughs> Chicago is a big city. Most people want to go there. You can find suburbs of Chicago where people can have Javen sort of underserved areas and stuff. And you know, most people want to go there and that's why it just gets done. This year was the only exception in the last 10 years. This is the 11th year in a row. But this year they got uh, delayed with finishing up and they didn't get enough applications. I think some of the applicants didn't qualify. That's why they went to a second cycle of selecting J1 waivers in January. Lots of states have like this. You know, Some states just accept applications starting October till they fill up. And there's no end date. A lot of states usually, you know, they have two cycles, October and January. And uh, in October, they have the first cycle. If they fill up the, all the 30 positions, fine. If not, they give you second round in January and stuff. If, if that doesn't happen either, if they don't fill up in January all the 30 spots, then they, they come out again in another, another quarter, another four months or three months later. So they do that until they fill up. Every state has its own individual things. You just go to a, whatever state you're trying to go to, plan out ahead. Which state do I want to go to work in? Or which couple states do I want to go to work in? so that you're ready and you get your that state's license and that state's uh, jobs you apply for and then you finalize that stuff and you go to that state's website for the public health department uh, and then see what their specific criteria are for when to apply and stuff. Most of the time it will be September, October, will be the start of it. How do we know these numbers that you're seeing, like 30, which which site is it from? Coming from. Oh, okay. All the resources are in your the Word documents that I'll send it out to you. Mm. So, you know, you can sort of have everything right in one document. Please, please make sure you save these. It took a lot of work and effort, so it will be sort of very time saving for you guys and save you a lot of effort. So, okay. thank you. Um, and then, does it matter to do like uh, to get a permanent licensure in Illinois if we plan to work in another state, or just take that? Other if you are working for the VA, the Veterans Administration, they will accept any state's license. You can work for the VA anywhere in the country with some other state's license. So, with the VA, if you're practicing only for the VA, then and you're not getting an extra H1B for moonlighting or something, then you don't need any other state license except one state, so any what state. I'm planning to work in New York, but I'm graduating soon. So should I go for New York? You will need a New York state license to practice there, obviously. So, uh, and I think you will need that for a J1 waiver too. Maybe they'll wait for it. I guess I know, I'm not sure they would be that in you know, that particular about it. <laughs> Sorry about that. Um, so, um, common, I'll come back to the Javen stuff. I just wanted to make sure you, you knew what to plan for beforehand. Um, common expenses you need to plan for. Again, a couple years before, start saving. You know, make sure you have five, six thousand dollars set apart for this kind of stuff. Or, you know, make sure you can apply for credit cards and your credit score is not that bad. <laughs> so, uh, sideboard exam fees. You know, it'll be that's that'll be a big chunk. Twenty-seven hundred dollars now. I don't know 
my economy it might go up or not. It's, it's, it's a healthy market now. Fortunately, you don't have the part two oral boards anymore. That was like two or three thousand dollars. Is that our program sponsors something? What, for what? <laughs> for board. Because yeah. family medicine does that. Sheila, that is a good point for you. In my <laughs> yeah, seriously. Family medicine does give 1700 bucks, half the amount of uh, board fees, if they apply and pass the board in first attempt on the day of, I mean, on the year of graduation. So they're giving you an incentive. So that is for their, uh, like, kind of, uh, uh, yeah, incentive. Board yeah. Because if they can publish that our uh, graduates mm -hmm. uh, pass in first year so and so number. So sure. we can talk with uh, our TD. So, so Sheila, you can note down. Good luck with that. Thank you. Um, <laughs> so Just basically, money. talk to other boards is not there. Um, if you do want to make sure, uh, you also save some other other stuff. The other mm -hmm. states licensure and stuff will also cost you some money. Um, the controlled substance license is, is a small amount as it goes hand in hand with the other state license. The DA, I think, costs you a little more. I'm not sure. Should I have you applied for, applied for the DA yet? No. Okay. So I'm not sure how much it costs, but you need to plan for that. You can look it up on the DA, on the DA website. The APA membership after, sort of, you know, that, that is something you want to have too, uh, so that you, know, you can be part of a professional association. Uh, board review courses some people apply for can cost you a hefty amount of money, I would say. And, you know, gym waiver expenses. They are, again, with the lawyer, with uh, other stuff, can cost you anywhere between, you know, four, five, six thousand dollars, depending on how you approach it. Some people do the gym waiver themselves. They don't hire a lawyer. Some people have done it. Dr. Aluri did his national interest waiver by himself. He did everything top to bottom. So I think SI's lawyers help him too. Um, and with, in my case, my employing hospitals, lawyer, they have an in-house lawyer, they have to you know, get up everything. They are paying for pretty much all of these expenses except for the license that I've already applied for. So you can negotiate that, especially the women. In general, women make less money than male doctors. There is research to prove that. Because they don't want to negotiate, maybe because at the point of negotiation, they just do. It's so anxiety provoking that they don't want to do it. They just want to get away with it, get away from that situation, even though they make a few thousand dollars less. It's a sort of, I don't know if it's negotiation or stuff, but in general, there's data to prove that women doctors make less money. So please negotiate, please be aware of that. Um, psychiatry salaries will range anywhere from, depending on the amount of work and the, if it's a for profit or not for profit, if it's private practice or not and stuff, um, hospital or not, it'll range anywhere from 150 to 160 to anywhere from 240 to 50, even $300,000 a year. Obviously, if you are doing inpatient stuff, it will pay you slightly more than outpatient. Uh, with J1, you might get slightly less amounts in rural areas and not-for-profit places, uh, but, you know, so choose what you want to do. Uh, obviously, you don't want to pay too much attention to the money and, you know, just be going only on the looker because um, there's lots of places which promise you stuff, especially smaller practices, solo practitioners uh, from your own country. Just be sort of cautious about those. I'm not saying everybody is not to be trusted, but be very cautious because German physicians in the past have been sort of used as slave labor and have not been paid the amounts promised. And once you are in a German job, getting out of it can be very difficult. You have to prove to the, the USCIS that there are extenuating circumstances. Otherwise, if you can't prove that, you have to finish those three years up. And then you don't want to be working on a resident salary and putting all those hours and stuff. And so, you know, be treated unfair. Um, so go with a group that is recognized, bigger groups, hospitals, they're more accountable. So uh, that's something you want to keep in mind, academic places. Um, travel expenses, please plan for these. Make sure you have a few thousand dollars in there. Uh, um, I just told you what that was already. Where do you look for jobs? For the J1 people especially. Illinois, if you want to work in Illinois, the Illinois Primary Healthcare Institution is a very good resource. They have an idea of rural, rural areas that needs jobs. They, most of them will qualify for the J-1 waivers. Um, and Ashley Colville out there is very helpful. These are not-for-profit. 
all. They, their only job is, their only uh, sort of interest is to make sure rural, people in rural areas, underserved areas get doctors. They are, I think they are, I don't know how much government stuff is there in there, but they were very helpful. They had my interest in mind. And lots of doctors, on the, even on the net, vouch for them and stuff. Ashley Colville uh, is uh, the, I think, the in charge of recruitment there. She's very helpful, very nice. She was the one who put me in touch with this em employer that I am now working at. I'm now going to work under. Um, the National Health Service Corps um, also sponsors a lot of Javens. Uh, they will uh, actually forgive your student loan if you have any in America. So for us, it's going to be tricky because we don't have much educational loan in America. So just you know, telling you. Um, I don't think they'll forgive any other loans. So be aware of that. Uh, Veterans Administration. The J1 through VA are well, some of, are e relatively easier than other places because VA has a lot of experience with J1 waivers. And also, some people vouch for the VA work. Some people don't like the way the whole thing works. It's more bureaucratic, they say. It's more laid back. Um, Dr. Robinson, I don't, know, I don't know how many of you remember, he was working at the VA now in San Francisco. He really enjoys it. He likes the atmosphere there. Uh, I have had other doctors say that they don't like the way the VA works. It's more sort of like stiff shirt kind of stuff. So everybody has their, has their own set of experiences, but uh, if VA's salaries have improved significantly too, you can find easily above $200,000. Uh, it's not a big deal. Uh, there's lots of places, a couple places in Illinois too, which are under the VA, and you can practice even outpatient or inpatient or mix, depends on what you want. Um, but the VA won't let you, just a second, the VA won't let you apply at least until you're four months before graduating. So it can cut things a little, make you a little nervous, so you won't have any backups and stuff. So if you decide to go with the VA, it has, can be a little nerve wracking. I called the VA about nine or eight or nine months before I graduated, but sorry, ten months before I graduated, and they said, please call us in April or May. Like, I'm graduating in August, and they want to call, please call in April or May, because they want to wait until they try and recruit Americans or, or citizens first. I think that's the requirement for the job postings and stuff, because since VA is government. Um, so that's one thing that you, know, you can look under. If everything else fails and you're Say, if for sometimes, you know, Javen Waiver's jobs, your employer says, at the last moment, this is too difficult for us, we don't want to do it. You're not that invested. And so, she like, you get tired, please handle it. So, if, if your employer says, no, we, we give up, we don't want to do the visa anymore, um, then VA could be a backup plan. So, just wanted to throw it out there. Second, second question. Yeah, that's one of the questions. Like, how soon the VA can? Four, four or five months before you graduate, you can call them and look at jobs. The VA website has you know extensive list of job listings and stuff. Um, so practicelink.com, they post jobs all over the country. I found a lot of resources there. Practicelink also publishes a magazine um, that's useful. Some of the resources from a magazine I picked and put in your Word document at the end, so that will be useful to you. Um, they send, uh, if you apply, or put your resume on Black Practice Link, all the recruiters will send you a lot of stuff. Um, you may or may not choose to do that. Um, the magazine is pretty useful. It's free, I think. Uh, if you just apply for it online, they'll send it to your head. It's free, of course. It's pretty useful. Um, psych departments of various universities, always network as much as you can. And you can try and say psychiatry too. You know, I'm sure if they will want some doctors from our, our own people to join them. Um, and I say psychiatry pays quite, play, pays quite well. You know, I think uh, typical salaries here is a base plus incentive. I think 130 plus about 60, 65. So it uh, for, amounts to about 190, 195,000 uh, dollars. For an academic setting, it's pretty decent. Um, local psychiatry practices, you can try, you know, like, uh, but I don't know how many of them would be underserved. Uh, in here, Pine Street is not underserved. It's not going to cost much. Um, or in Sarma Group will not cost much. No way. Uh, you can try the community health centers, the mental health centers in Illinois, but you can you have to try all over the country and wherever you want to go, especially in the state you want to go to. Local most mental health centers you always look at the financial whatever job you apply for, make sure the employer has a good financial background. 
ask for their recent financial data. Are they making a profit? If they're not for profit, how long have they been running? Are they going in the black or are they in the red? Um, that stuff you always need to ask for. If they promise you some child exit, just don't jump for it. Get all, as much data as you can from the people who are trying to employ you, the, the people who work for them. Say, for example, uh, when, I go, when I'm going there's a geriatric psychiatrist, I had like a 45 minute conversation with him on the phone before I went to interview him. Um, so to make sure, you know, how the work climate is, because he's the one who knows better than most people and he's the one who, you know, sort of gets, gets a better idea of stuff. You know, they are in the, in the grinding mill, they know what they, what's going on there. Uh, most people I found are pretty helpful, they were nice about it, they did answer my questions, seemingly truthfully. So, and they're psychiatrists too, so they know how it is. Um, Network with your peers and attendees. Uh, I spoke to Dr. Hassan, he gave me a few ideas. Dr. Elbury gave me a few ideas. Always network. And look at com com company available job postings on the hospital, board, anywhere. Um, In-house recruiters are those people who work for the specific hospital. These are not headhunters. They, their interest is the particular hospital that employs them. Big groups like Kaiser Permanent or other people, uh, Mayo Clinic, they have their own in-house recruiters. Decatur, St. Mary's has their, I think, she's, she's the HSHS recruiter, uh, Debbie Hoffmeister. She uh, recruits only for HSHS. So they are not trying to sort of scout you or do anything of that sort. They're, they are in-house people. Their interest would be more aligned with the employing hospital and stuff. And they were pretty nice about giving me information and all of that stuff. Um, physician recruiting organizations are, you know, the regular recruiters that are not in-house. They are independents. They can range from just fly by night operators to really experienced companies. So always ask if you if you are going through this modality, make sure they have experience with JVNs. Most of them don't want to do any JVNs now because it's complicated um, and because you know, it's going to want to do that. Uh, I have a few companies in mind, but I don't want to sell anything here. My job is to help you out guys, not to you know, sell anything here. It's not. And I forgot to disclose stuff. I have no interest here. I'm not affiliated with these companies or recruiters or any kind of stuff. Uh, I just found that there was a deficiency in training uh, of this kind of information. That's why I wanted to present it. I would also propose that later on, maybe next year on, whoever's graduating would continue kind of this thing and present it similarly so that the juniors benefit from it, sort of maintain a cycle. Uh, John Yost. Sorry? John Yost. John Yost, yeah. <laughs> I don't know how much you know about J1s, so. though. Um, a lot of Indian yoga. <laughs> uh, the job interview. So once you start applying for jobs, you have you have the time frame fixed up, you have everything fixed up and stuff, and you want to know sort of what to do at the job interview. So um, you, find, you, know, you look through all of these places, you find, oh, this place has a J1 offering. And um, before I get here, the J1 stuff, um, if the recruiters are okay with it, some recruiters do specialize in J1s, they're okay with it, and you find some jobs where they know oh, all that stuff, or you apply to a VA, or a few different things, and you know you find that these are a few jobs, especially on practice leave too, um, that these are a few jobs you want to apply to. So call them, don't say J1 outright. Talk to them, tell them what they want, what their publish index is like. And any job you look at, if you like it and the profile is good, or even any job you look at, you can just look it up if it's in an underserved area, or if it's medically underserved, or in a health, health professional shortage area. Also, we call it MUA, HPSA, in short. Um, there's a website to look it up, and so that you can find if it will qualify for J1 or not, how, how good the scores are and stuff. All of that is given you Word document resources, and you can look it up. Okay, that will make your life a lot easier. Uh, it's going to be a little bit of research, but it has to be done. You guys can even, you know, whoever's looking for stuff can pull up your information and list every jobs, you know, all the jobs that you find, you know, sort of in, on the L drive or, you know, maybe on a common sort of Google Drive or something of that sort. So you know, use tech as much as you can. Collaborate, it's going to be better. As I use Facebook page would be a good place to post that kind of stuff. Um, just throwing out ideas. Um, the... Um, Yes. Uh, the recruiters, I'm asking because I don't know. Are they the ones who have a fee of your salary? Thank you for pointing that out. 
Thank you for pointing it out. Um, recruiters typically, you know, should not be charging you anything. There's an agency that charges physicians for contract review. I'm not going to name the agency because that's not what, what I want to do. If you want to ask me later, I can do that later. But, um, typically, if there's a recruiter, they should be charging the employer for stuff. You should not be charged anything. So if they do charge you money, that's something they should in general. I did not have to pay anybody in time. Um, there was a recruiter who did my contact analysis for gratis, for free for me. So, um, it was a pretty good job of it. You know? um, um, so the uh, job interview itself, um, once you get your job lined up and they are, oh, they are going to sponsor J1s, they are in rural, in most rural areas, rural hospitals will sponsor J1s and the VA and other places. I'll tell you more, more about the other places too. Um, job interviews, once you get to them, sometimes you have four interviews. It's some just some, they are scouting out how, how, what you want, are you just in alignment with them or not, and then they usually go on to uh, you know, main interviews. So far, whatever four interviews I had always led to physical interviews because like job market is very, very, very um, in favor of the residents and the doctors because there's very high demand and you're in very short supply. So you are, think of yourself as a, as a very valuable human resource. So don't forget that. Okay, so the negotiation is in your hands. You're, 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 you're always heavier. Um, don't get cocky, but that's how it is. Um, Getting to Yes is a very good book on negotiating. It will teach you how to negotiate a little bit. It's a short sleeve thing. Uh, it doesn't take long to accomplish. It's it's nice. So you might want to go through that. If you guys are you know sort of hardcore negotiators and stuff, then that's fine. Um, but I found it useful. Um, research the job before going to the interview. You know, what kind of stuff they have. What go to their websites. Um, try talking to a few people who work there. Do your due diligence because you know going there you don't want to ask them what basic stuff like you know. Are you a hospital or a solo group practice or something like that? A little bit of information so you can at least show that you're educated about it, show that you're interested. Um, they're spending a lot of time and effort to, to get you there, so it will be just fair. Um, the other thing is that travel expenses, flight tickets, gas that, ex that you expend, hotel stays, everything is usually paid by the employer. The, 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 the interviewer. Don't hesitate to ask. If you don't ask, you don't get it. Sometimes. Okay? And it's okay. Even if you're on J1 visa, these expenses you can take. They take from them. It's it's kosher. It's legal. That's fine. I spoke to a lawyer about it. Um, so, have all your questions ready beforehand. You know, what kind of questions you want to ask. I'll have another slide about it in a minute. So, I think I'll have to hurry up, but we should be fine. Um, have a paper and pen ready there, you know, to write down what their salary offers are, the benefits are, and stuff. Sometimes they'll give you a printed page with all the data on it. Sometimes they won't, depend on how organized they are, you know. That's one way to assess them, too, but anyway. So have a paper and pen ready to do all the stuff. Keep all those papers. It's because in a, after you go to a number of interviews, everything sort of blends into your mind. After that, you have objective ways to evaluate. Okay? So, so whatever critical questions you have, always write them on a couple pieces of paper and then ask them those questions. It's fine. They'll actually be happy that you're asking them all the details because you know it shows them that you're interested. Um, please dress well. <laughs> uh, some of the stuff is pretty obvious, but you know might help. Um, take a printed copy of your CV. Sometimes they forget who you are, what your accomplishments are. It, it's useful to give give them a copy of your CV. Make, maybe just make a few copies, carry a file folder with it. Uh, there's a bunch of different people who come in on that day to interview. Sometimes it's a panel interview and stuff. So you can just hand out your CVs to them. It shows them that you're organized. Don't be late. Um, I had a bad experience because my car malfunctioned. And they got pretty confrontational. So people don't take kindly to it, but don't be late. Uh, also depends on what kind of program it is. You don't want to go through a bad experience. Um, avoid interrupting people. Let them have their say. Listen a lot. You're a psychiatrist. We know all this stuff. Um, 
sort of, you know, let them do their thing, let them feel like they are conveying what they want to convey. Um, if you can send a thank you note afterwards, um, uh, I usually send them an email and stuff, but I think this is a matter of why you want to do it there with you. Um, request reimbursement. Um, what to ask? This is just a brief overview of it. Okay, don't talk money till they bring it up. <laughs> you don't want to sound greedy. Uh, discuss everything else first. Well, almost everything else. Okay, well, I'll come back to the salary and stuff and stuff. Um, job profile. What kind of people they work for? Adult population, child population. How much child are you comfortable doing? How much, you know, geriatrics are you comfortable doing? You have to decide that for your child beforehand. Some people don't want to do child. Some people are pretty comfortable with it. Dr. Medina is a child psychiatrist. He does both child and adult work. Dr. Soltis does both. Um, so, this is what you want to figure out, what you want to do with your life. And so, or if you're in a different fellowship, what kind of patients do you want to work with? Or patient or inpatient? Decide what you want. A mixture or how much call do you want? So you decide what you want and then go, go with a fixed idea. But keep your, open, keep your mind open because you're not even, sometimes it may not work exactly as you want. And you may be surprised, you may like actually what you want later on. And you know, having a very rigid mindset may be the hindering your cause. Um, so sort of ask them, you know, what kind of call schedule will be, who will cover, who admits patients, you know, which hospitals, how do I make referrals, and who's outpatient, who follows up, all of this data. How many other psychiatrists? How is call divided? So make sure you do your due diligence, the analysis, talk to the people who work there, always. Take them aside, talk to them, talk to them later. Get their phone numbers that day. Talk to them individually. You know, at least a couple people from each place so that you know what kind of situation it is. One hospital asked me to come, go there and do an interview, and I spoke to the psychiatrist beforehand. He gave me a pretty dismal picture. He had been employed recently, and things wasn't working out right. It was very hectic. Life wasn't good. So he was still trying to bash the program. He gave me a very honest opinion. He looked like a very calm, collected guy, and he wanted to. He was going to be there for another three or four years because he wanted that job. Anyways. Um, and what kind of administrative time would you get? Would you be paid for that kind of stuff? Would you be paid for only clinical work? Um, what's the patient population? You know, payer mix is what? Like you know, Medicare, Medicaid, and private insurance and stuff. With the J1, 51% of your population has to be Medicare, Medicaid. Otherwise, it won't qualify as a kind of stuff. Um, what kind of support staff do you have? Nursing, ancillary staff, and all that. Um, what opportunities do you have for teaching and research and all that kind of stuff? You get the general picture. So get this all this stuff. Negationally policy, just ask at the end, just like the money, because you have, you, you don't want to sound greedy or sound lazy or that kind of stuff. Um, ask them in very generalities, and you can ask specifics after you leave the interview or you know, at the end of the interview, or if they, they'll probably bring it up and stuff. Or you can ask them at the end just to be okay. Um, any other questions you might want to ask? Money. When, the, when it comes to money, you want to make sure, so how much are they offering? They usually bring it up themselves at the end. Otherwise, you'll have to ask. Or if you're not comfortable asking or negotiating, you always have a backup. If you're using a recruiter, have a recruiter talk to them. They'll give you an idea. They'll give you how much they're going, they can go up on. And you can tell them, I have these big loans and stuff, and stuff, so I'm looking for a sort of a, what kind of range will you be looking at? I have a few other offers too, which have offered, you know, uh, other offers, but I'm trying to give them, you get an objective picture. I have considered these and these options, and there's all, all kinds of stuff <coughs> going on. But I want to see how much you will be sort of be, off, be able to offer me too. Uh, and I'm not, I'm, I, I assure them they're not looking just for money, and they're going to look at the whole thing entirely and make it as objective as possible. You know, what kind of situation there is, what kind of people they are, what kind of population there is. You need to make sure you look interested. Be nice. You know, ask them as, as many questions as possible. Uh, you never know who, what kind of person you might have to deal with later. So, uh, try not to burn the bridges. So, that's a you know, look at benefits. How much are productivity bonuses? What kind of remuneration do they have? You know, do they have a base salary plus an incentive, which is increasingly more common? Do they have just a base salary, uh, no productivity? 
do they have entire productivity? So you eat what you kill. The number of patients you see and stuff, you make that kind of money. Some positions are bait and switch. First year or something, you will be offered as base salary only, or base salary plus productivity. Next year on, you're all on your own. Especially private practices in remote areas tend to do that. It can take time to build your practice in the employing setting, whatever you are. So at least two years is a reasonable amount of time to have a base plus productivity sign. Uh, don't go entirely, try not to go entirely productivity in starting a second year or first year itself. So you don't want to end up, you know, make, making a very little money because of stuff that is out, out, out of your hand. Even if you are very competent, you think you can make a lot of money, but what if they don't have no patients? So, um, the other stuff that I want to make sure, you know, uh, what kind of expenses will they cover for you? My hospital pretty much said, any expenses you have, these are licensing, DEA, CME, everything will cover. So you can negotiate that. So I have these, these are these expenses, will you be able to cover these? Talk to them, be, sometimes you have to be blunt. Um, uh, just be nice about it. Uh, do you offer uh, signing amounts? Do you offer a stipend? I pretty much went out and asked. And some said, we are not for profit, we can't do that. Some said, yeah, sure, we'll do it. Uh, for J1 people, don't ask for stipends. I spoke to an immigration lawyer, and you eventually apply for a green card. Getting a stipend, that is getting money from an employer before you start employment, which is on a monthly basis, sounds like you're working for them. Before you got the visa, before you got the H1B. Stinks. Can look bad on your uh, green card application later. They'll look at your tax records and stuff. So don't. No stipends. You can get signing amounts. It's fine. It's just an incentive. What is stipend? Stipend is a monthly thing you get. So you, you're getting like a salary. Like a salary. See, it sounds like a salary. So that's why I just be cautious about. It. Don't ask for a monthly stipend. Ask for a signing amount. You know, since you're not asking for a stipend, you can ask for a higher signing amount or something. I did the same thing. So make sure you get your calculations in order. Signing amount can vary from zero to thirty, forty thousand dollars. Okay. Um, uh, yep, uh, anything I missed here? Yeah, that's fine. So uh, you can, the travel expenses they pay for, the other remuneration they give you with the signing amount and stuff, the gas expenses, hotel stay and stuff, they can pay you. It's all taxable, so eventually that will be taxed from you too. Make sure you filed everything and make sure you um, have those checks in order so you can file them in the tax stuff later too. Don't miss that because that will put you in hot water. Uh, so don't take a stipend. If most people, most employers are not aware of this. So tell them that, okay? Signing amounts are fine. One-time signing amounts is fine. Well, the, the Department of State has clarified this in some long ago statute, so you're fine. Go ahead. Another question about uh, insurance, uh -huh. like practice insurance and all that, the big form right now, or do you pay for it? I'll come to it. Contracts. Once you're ready, you want to sign. So uh, you know, what do you want to do? Uh, you sign your contract and stuff. Before you sign it, make sure you go through it in detail. Um, review it properly, look at stuff, and I'll tell you what to look for. Get it reviewed by a lawyer who's familiar with medical job contracts. It cost me like $600 to get it reviewed, but I did it because it was very, very, very important. Because you would be living it under the contract for three years. You know? What kind of job profile is it listing on the contract? What are they saying? Do, uh, do they, are they writing down everything that they promised? My hospital employer wrote down everything. You know, we'll pay him this, this, and this money. We'll pay him this amount. We'll make him work for this many hours. We'll not do inpatient. We'll do only outpatient. We will give him these, these business benefits. We'll give him this, this amount of productivity. We'll give him, you know, uh, this coverage for malpractice. We'll give him this amount of money for CME. Everything is listed in my contract. Make sure it's specific. Sometimes your contracts are vague. You don't want that. I had my contract extensively reviewed. They got mad at me, but I got it done. So, anyways, um, non-compete clauses. These are uh, clauses that say, well, you cannot work inside this, say 30 miles outside this area if you leave us before time. Or even if you leave us after three or four years, you cannot practice in 30 miles or 40 miles or well, whatever they specify for 10 years or something of that sort. 
most places want you to do non-public clauses. The amount of area that they want to cover uh, usually depends on that. I had mine reduced from like 40 miles or something to 25, 20 miles. So that did not fall within Gibson City's code to Champaign. So uh, I, do, I don't want Champaign out of the coverage area. So I, I don't want to be like, I can't practice in Champaign after three years for about seven years or something because of this contract. I don't want to do that. So look at your coverage area. Make sure the long coverage draws. Typically, 7 to 20 miles is okay. But it you know, also depends. If you don't want non coverage, say, I don't, I'm not going to use non coverage. What if you want to stay there? If you have a family there, you have everything set up, you don't want to move after, you give up the job. You're, you're done with three years of the jail. Now you don't want to move. You have your family, your kids children are going to school there. Because of non coverage draws, you have to go to another city to work. Does that make sense? So keep that in mind uh, of non coverage clauses. See what you're comfortable with and stuff. Tail coverage issues. Now, malpractice insurance and psychiatrists is, you know, some of the lowest among the specialties. I will go ahead for another five, ten minutes. If you happen to have a conference and stuff, feel free to leave. The video will be on YouTube anyway. Um, the um, um, get your um, contact review. The tail coverage stuff. Um, malpractice insurance is sort of. It used to be occurrence based and claims based. So uh, I think most of it is now just claims based, which means that you know whenever they have a claim, regardless of the time period, I had more practice for insurance for say the first three years of my whenever I'm working for this employer for three years. If in this period of time while I'm working for the employer there's any malpractice done by me, and anybody files a complaint for it like 20 years after that, and if they if the courts agree to it if there is a malpractice charge, this person will cover for it. It's a claims-based kind of thing. Now, whenever a claim is made, during that, for a, for a practice or for a, something done, that, some clinical practice done in those, in that period of time, um, that will be covered. That's claims-based coverage. It is sort of less expensive than an occurrence-based uh, coverage, like covering a set period of time, whatever. I think I'm getting jumbled up here, but the bottom line is, there's something called a tail coverage. Once you're done with your employment, um, the hospital has to buy tail coverage for you. You know, what if uh, the, the, the insurance company will charge the hospital some amount, usually, if you leave early, usually triple the amount of your regular insurance for tail coverage, saying that, you know, if, what if somebody files for malpractice for this time that you work for after four or five? So tail coverage is, can be a hefty amount. Uh, if you leave some of the some clauses in the contracts can say he will have to pay the tail coverage after he leaves himself if he leaves before a set period of time. You don't want that. My hospital said five years. I said no. If I leave, it's a, uh, any time any time within the three years is fine. If I leave, I can pay the tail coverage and stuff. After that, I'm not going to. It's going to be three times psych insurance. It's anywhere between seven to ten thousand dollars a year. Uh, so if triple, triple that would be like thirty thousand dollars or forty thousand dollars in the hospital. You don't want that if you leave early or something happens. It, what if you don't work out with an employer? It's very hard. Uh, it's a very hard place to work under, and you have extenuating circumstances, and you leave J1 to find another place, and then you have to pay thirty, forty thousand dollars a year for tail coverage. That's very problematic. Detailed explanation of tail coverage and stuff is given in the resource that I gave you. It's a nice little article, a couple articles actually. Go through them, they are very helpful. Okay. Um, the bait and switch positions are the positions I described under saying that you know they switch to entirely productivity very quickly. So after the first year, first year you have base salary plus a little productivity, or just a base salary, and the second year automatically you're on your own. That can be a little too swift, that can cause you to lose money. So make sure at least two to three years you have you know the base salary plus productivity so that you have a set amount of guaranteed salary, okay? You don't want to make a resident salary when you're attending this kind of work. So those are some bait and switch positions. positions. Yeah. Um, I'm coming to nearly the end of it, but um, J1 waiver types. What types of J1 waiver do you have? Um, mainly three types. This is the only type most people would apply for the interested governmental agency. Uh, the hardship waiver is for those who say have spouses who are American citizens, um, 
who, if they leave the country, will cause a severe hardship to their children or spouses. And the spouses or children cannot leave with them to the other country for some mental health reasons, for some health reasons, for some really big family ties and stuff. It is very hard to get. It takes longer. It takes nine months, ten months to sort of process and stuff. Most of you don't want this. It's, most of you won't be able to go through this. Uh, asylum is for those people who can't go to their home country because of some issue like religious persecution and stuff. Uh, if you wanted to do asylum, you should have done it long ago before even applying for jail. So most of these people won't be able to do this too, but sometimes it has work out with some people. Just want, if you want to look up some data on it, up to you. I didn't go too much into it. Main thing is the interest of government agency. Uh, Senator Conrad is one guy, one senator in the, in, in the US. He, subs, uh, he suggested a program for you know 30 slots for jail and waiver doctors each and every state. Every state has 30 slots. That's the most common way of the jail and waiver stuff, apart from the VA. Uh, so Conrad 30 program is usually administered by the, you know, de the Department of Public Health in each state. They will do the September to October processing and stuff. They have 30 slots and that's all. These other agencies can sponsor jail and waivers too. But uh, they are not subject to the 30 cap. They are outside this. So you can apply to these even though they don't have 30 is filled out and stuff. So remember that. Appalachian Commission, I think this is Appalachian Mountains. Do you know what the area is, Sheila? Uh, yeah, it's the sort of Mountain Middle East. Okay. The Rocky yeah, Appalachian. Well, Rockies are on the west coast. Okay. This is on the east coast. Yeah. Department of Health and Human Services. Uh, this is also one of the agencies. They hire some of their own people. You can look up on their website. I gave the website in here uh, to find how they sponsor, what kind of stuff they sponsor, and you know, it's, it's a pretty small try com when when it comes to jail and waivers. VA is one of the major employers for jail and doctors, especially specialists and stuff, uh, non psychiatrists, because VA, uh, you know, says anybody can work for us, even if it's not even if it's not in another survey area. If you're working for VA, you can work, you know, pretty much anywhere you're in a city or something. Uh, mm -hmm. So that's one advantage to it. There's St. Louis suburbs that I saw had VA jobs available, and you can pretty much go there. Um, and you know. The only say, gastroenterologist and stuff has a J1 and stuff, and he wants to go work in the US instead of going back to his home country. VA would probably his own, be his only choice. Uh, Delta Regional Authority is uh, five, eight, five, six or eight states that are around the Mississippi Delta, I think. Uh, the, it, this is also sort of tries to get J1 doctors for the Delta region. If uh, you go to a place, say, in Missouri or Mississippi, where they want your neighbors, it's pretty rural area and stuff, and the Conrad 30 is filled up or something, go to the Delta. Talk to them, they'll sponsor it. Okay. Uh, I spoke to you about the hardship and asylum. Process is pretty complicated of the Javen waiver. It's 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 a huge headache. Uh, submit the Javen waiver to the interested government agency. Most commonly for the Conrad 30, that would be for NLI, would be NLI Department of Public Health or the respective Public Health Department of the state. Um, uh, so in your final year of, tra year of training, October, go ahead and apply. So for you, I guess it will be fourth year, so October. Um, employing hospital needs to send the relevant documents to the IGA, um, all of this stuff. I'll sort of keep it brief since we're running out of time. You can see it later. There's a detailed explanation some, uh, in another flowchart I want to show you. Um, so this is this brief, in brief, you know, the interest of government agency, so you apply to them, and you also go to the Department of State website, and you fill out the forms and stuff, and then the forms you mail, physically, they print out the forms, you, you print out the forms off from online, fill them out, and then you send them to the IDPH, or whichever interest of government agency it is, and they will say, okay, this guy is qualifies for June waiver, they'll give you a decision, yes or no, in a month or two or something, and then send the application the letter to and the application packet to the US. The US says usually says yes to it if I, a GA says yes, okay. And the US will send it to the Central Immigration, and Central Immigration ultimately you know says yes too, and then you, they allow you if they say yes, they will send you a letter and stuff, and they will say okay, send us an H1B application and stuff. As long as the US says yes and sends the application to US yes, you can apply for it. You won't have to wait for USCIS to say yes. Okay. 
And you know, once your platform is going to be, it takes a little time. You can your platform is going to be. Easy. If you are running short of time and stuff, you can go for premium processing. Within 15, 20 days, they can be ready. That's going to be nicer. Okay. Uh, this entire process can take you anywhere between six to eight months. That's why you need extra time. Okay. Um, so you can start in October. By the time you graduate, you should have all the stuff and the visa ready. My visa is not ready yet. Department of State lost my application. They took four months. I had to pressure them through a senator. For them to even tell me that they lost my application. I had to, I had to have the IGA send it again. So keep tabs on the timeline. Look at their typical timeline schedules. That's, I, I gave you some of the timeline stuff there in the resources too. So be very careful. So okay. you apply for it and be in the waiver time only? Yeah. Yes. Okay. You have to have as a visa as ready start. before you graduate. Okay. Or within the grace period. You, know, you have 30 days grace period after, before you have to leave the country. After if you graduation. Apply, yeah. If you apply for H1B, you don't have to leave the country. If your application is sent, you don't have to leave the country until you graduate, until the resident longer. So technically you'll be working in H1B, but in a J1 waiver program? J1 yeah. waiver is a waiver which you work for three years in another sub area, but the visa will be H1. Okay. okay. Make sense? Mm -hmm. And you have to apply for H1 separately. J1 waiver is separate is part of the versus H1 is separate. Process. Well, if you cannot apply for H1 until the OS says, yes, he's okay for J1 waiver. Okay. Detailed explanation, I'll come to it. Uh, so keep tabs on the timeline. You can go through a local senator from your employing hospital or something. Say, I'm having any delays, can you please help? They were nice about it. They helped me out. They pressured the GOS. Only they can contact it because GOS has huge red tape. Okay, be very careful with them. And you know, in general, bureaucracies in general, you don't trust bureaucracies. You have to do your own thing. You have to do your own due diligence. Um, apply for HMB once DOS submits the jail waiver. Don't wait for the USCIS to say, okay, we are okay with it. You will lose precious time there. And uh, interested government agencies, who are they like, what are the types of interest? All these five. Okay. Most commonly, you'll go through the Department of Public Health in each state for the contract help program. Okay. okay. Uh, I think you have seminar I'm going to take. Uh, so you can have to you have to file H1B before the end of residency to stay in the country, or else mm -hmm. you'll have to leave. If you leave without filing the H1B and your visa runs out and you already applied for J1 waiver, it's going to create more paperwork, more money, more complications. <coughs> so get this done. Uh, the national interest waiver is uh, Dr. Aluri did that. Instead of working three years, you work for five years in the rural area. You still do your J1 waiver processing and stuff. After that, you apply for the national interest waiver once you're working in a J1 waiver job. And this is something to get a green card after your J1 waiver. Instead of going again to H1B. So after three years of your J1 waiver, you'll have to again go to H1 visa. Problem. Regular on the H1 visa until you can get a green card. For green card, you need something called labor certification, which means that this, the USCIS, the labor central people, have to decide that this guy needs to stay here, and the job that he's doing is not going to be filled by Americans, and we are not stealing jobs from American people. And so that can be very complicated. It can take up to two years and stuff. National interest waiver is a way of getting up, by, bypassing labor certification and saying, I'm doing a job which is in national interest, rural areas. It is a national interest. Most most physicians can do national interest waiver and get easily their their national interest waivers done. It, is, it has to be to, for a total term of five years. It doesn't have to be like three years for J1 waiver and then another five years for national interest. No. The three years of J1 waiver will still be counted under the five years and you have to do two more years and stuff. And then you are directly eligible for uh, green card? Yes. Once you apply for the national interest waiver job, and once you apply for the national interest waiver, once they agree to it, you can directly apply for a green card. So you, you may get green card before five years finish? Yeah. Santosh got his green card already. But it is the next interest? Huh? Santosh is not his I don't think so. No. Instead of applying for J1 waiver with H1B, you go through national interest waiver. You have to do your J1 waiver, you have to do your H1B visa. After you get that done, after you start your J1 waiver job, then you apply for national interest waiver. What is the downside? It's five years? Yeah. And you don't have to work in the same place after three years. You can go to another under survey area for three years. So that's your international interest waiver. Travel, as I already mentioned, once you apply for H1B, you don't have to uh, leave the country. But if you're applying for a J1 within the country, 
and you applied here and then uh, you want to go to a country after your residency sort of uh, time runs out and your visa, the German visa has expired, that can create additional complications and create more paperwork and more, mo more money will be cost to you. So try not to do that. If you want to go home, feel free to travel before your visa, German visa expires. Take vacation before you graduate. Okay? Or take vacation after you find a new job. So what, once you graduate, like how long you cannot travel? Don't travel until you get your HMB. HMB. <laughs> Typically speaking. General guidelines, this is my last page. Uh, keep your medical medical records and notes. S compare all the jobs, write everything down, whatever you ask them and stuff, so you can compare later on. Okay? Um, plan ahead of time, the two years, as I, as I told you, do your homework stuff, just find out data about the, re the, the employers and stuff, and uh, you need a lot of research for, for, finding out all, for finding out all these IGA, the interest with government agencies and stuff, so it takes a lot of time. Uh, network as much as possible with people. SIU Javan waiver is pretty easy to accomplish. Santosh told me that things went pretty smoothly for him. They are hired uh, for a law firm in Bloomington and stuff, so it makes things easier. Hiring a lawyer eventually probably might be a good idea for you guys. Uh, just go to the in-house lawyer in the hospital, or if you're not comfortable, just hire a lawyer or something. It might cost you a little bit of money, but still it doesn't take away your responsibility to check on everything. And make sure the timelines are okay. Make sure the lawyer knows his stuff. It's just a lot of effort. SIU's lawyers are pretty experienced. And stuff. Most universities will have counsel lawyers, and they, they'll take care of things pretty fine. Um, the BS 2019. Jennifer Rogers is your program license. She will have all your past DS 2019s to submit the Department of State application for the Conrad Tardy waiver or any kind of uh, German waiver. You need your 2019 waivers. DS 2019 forms from the first year to the last year. You may not have all of those. Jennifer Rogers has all the copies, just get it from her. Okay? Then make sure you keep track of that because if you don't miss them, then it can really delay your application. It can be a huge headache. Uh, FCDS is a sort of a central agency, yes? Wait, so for the DS forms, do they have to be the signed ones, the ones with the stamps, or the, yeah. the ones that she has are not stamped? They don't necessarily have to be signed. Okay, so it just has to be the form. Okay. Um, FCDS is a sort of credential verification agency if you're applying to a lot of states. You pay them a set amount of money and then they will send out your documents. You send your documents to them and they'll send it to whoever you want to apply for whichever state. If you're applying for only one or two states, you don't need it for now. Okay? Um, and make sure you all have all your certificates, all your you know, past certificates, current ones, everything with you and copies electronically scanned into something like Dropbox or Google Drive or something so that you can access them anywhere you want. Okay, or send copies to people. Use technology as much as you can. Uh, residents and fellows on Javen, please don't accept stipends from pro prospective employers. Uh, signing bonus and travel reimbursement and stuff are all fine. You can accept them. It won't hurt your green card application later. Um, small practitioners, solo practitioners, especially from your home countries. Due uh, <laughs> diligence. Okay. I just wanted to show you one more thing. Thank you. Thank you for being patient with me. I really appreciate it. This is your process of your IGA waiver process. The, this is the most important thing. This is your flowchart. I have included all the flowcharts in the web links that I used to include in the resources. I'll email it to you in a few minutes. Uh, so this is the whole process of your uh, waiver. So from start to finish. Once you start, you know, sign the contract and submit it to the Interested government agency, this is how long it takes, and this is the whole process. Um, I'm not going to go into details and stuff. You can just pretty, pretty much read it. If you have any questions, feel free to talk to me or ask me questions. I'll always be available. You have my number. Uh, in my personal email, I'll just send it out.